Welcome uh, to Chem Doctor. Now, the purpose of this presentation is to introduce the concept of electron configuration. And the reason that, that I need to do this is because many chemical reactions that happen between elements involve the exchange of electrons. For example, the formation of ions involves usually a metal element which loses electrons in a reaction with a nonmetal that gains the electrons. The net result is an imbalance of protons and electrons in the two elements with the formation of ions. Additionally, you can have a reaction between two elements that results in a covalent compound where the actual formation of ions does not occur, yet there still is a net sharing of electrons and uh, this in itself involves uh, electron configuration. So to, to understand more fully how uh, the exchange of electrons occurs, then we need to know the basics about electron configuration. Um, additionally, when electron exchange happens, the electrons that are being exchanged are moving from the surface of one atom to the surface of another atom. And in order to understand the difference between uh, surface electrons and core electrons, we need to understand the basics of electron configuration. Now, to start this discussion, what I'm going to do is I want you to focus on the diagram I, I have over here on the right side of the screen. The electronic structure of an atom boils down to what we call the shell model that has its origins in the quantum mechanical model of the atom. Now, we don't have the time, and nor do I want to delve into that kind of complexity, because what I want to do is keep this as simple as possible. So for this video, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on, it, on atoms that cannot have more than 18 total electrons. So if you look at the periodic table, the, the particular element that has 18 electrons is argon. So we're dealing with what amounts to be the first three periods of the periodic table. So to start, let me just remind you of, of the basics of the periodic table. Number one, for this discussion, we're going to focus on what are called the main group elements. These are the elements that appear in groups 1A through 8A. 1A through 8A. So we, we are excluding that transition metal, the transition metal elements. All right, And uh, the only metals that we are going to include in this discussion will be the metals out of group 1A and group 2A. Specifically the alkali earth metals which are group 1A and the alkaline earth metals which are group 2A. And then we will only be considering elements from 3A through 8A, remember that the group 8A elements are the noble gases. Period number represents the horizontal row moving left to right across the periodic table. So we are only in this case going to be concerned with the first three periods of the periodic table. More specifically, remember that the period number is actually equal to the energy level that is being filled as we move left to right across the table. And group number represents what we call the valence electrons, or these are the surface electrons on any particular element. All right, now, before we get started into the basics of electron configuration, I want to bring you to the right side of my screen here. And what, I'm, what I've done here is I've, I'm giving you a schematic of how the shell model works for atoms, all right? So you basically can break down where you find the electrons into three energy levels. Remember, for our purposes, we're only discussing this out to argon, which has 18 electrons. Obviously, the true story is a lot more complex than this, but for our opening presentation on electron configuration, I want to keep things simple. So in our little world right here, we're only considering atoms that will have a maximum of 18 electrons. In, in the case of the shell model, that means we're dealing with a situation where there are only going to be three shells. Each of these shells is an energy level. 
the energy level is defined as e either n equal 1, n equal 2, or n equal 3. n equal 1 is the shell which is closest to where the protons are. n equal 2 represents an energy level that's a further distance away from the protons. And energy level 3 in this case is yet a further distance away. So energy level 3 electrons are much further away from where the protons are in the nucleus than energy 1 electrons. And energy 2 electrons are further away from the nucleus where the protons are than energy level 1 electrons. Now, one of the things that you need to think about in the back of your mind as we talk about this is that the way the relationship works between the electrons and the protons is the fact that they've got opposite charges. The charge on the proton indicated by a plus sign. The charge on the electron indicated by the negative sign. Remember what I've said in previous videos. The plus and the negative is really an arbitrary assignment. What this indicates is that these two particles have a mutual attraction for each other whose magnitude of attraction is the same in the case of both particles but opposite in direction so the two particles are attracted to one another the most stable the lowest potential energy configuration you can have for these two particles is going to be the one where the two particles are as close together as they can get the further the separation is the more distance you have between the two particles the higher in potential energy of the two particles and the easier it is to separate them the further the distance is that they are apart so I have indicated these complexities on my diagram so you can see as we move from n1 to n3 the distance from the electrons in those respective energy levels is getting further away from the protons the potential energy is decreasing as we move from n3 to n1 so n1 electrons are in lower potential energy than n3 electrons similarly the ionization energy because n1 electrons have lower potential energy than n3 the ionization energy is higher to remove an n1 electron than it is an n3 electron and again it's because of this reason down here your n3 electrons are much further away from the proton or the protons than n1 electrons. This is, might be a decent way to think about this, where this scenario right here is n1, and this scenario down here is n3, for example, just a real qualitative way of looking at it. All right, now, I am defining my electrons as being a half arrow, and the, the arrow can either be written pointed up or pointed down. And like I said, the model that we're looking at here, the shell model that we're looking at here, is is focused on an atom that cannot have more than 18 electrons and what I've done in this diagram is I've shown you how the energy shells are broken down for energy e uh, equal to 1, N2, and N3 you can see that in N1 there is only one type of orbital we call this a 1S the S orbitals can only hold a maximum of two electrons each energy shell has at least one s orbital. In n1 we call the s orbital 1s. In n2 we call it 2s. And in n3 we call it 3s. The number just designates which energy level that s orbital is present in. You see that when we move to n2 from n1 our lives get more complicated because the orbitals that we find in N2 have expanded to include what we call the 2p suborbitals, of which there are three. So energy level 2 can hold a maximum of 8 electrons. 2, 4, 6, 8. The 2p system holds a maximum of 6 electrons. Similarly, when we move to N3, for period three elements where argon has got the maximum number of electrons, you see that N3 also holds a maximum of eight electrons. So for the first three periods of the periodic table, now you can see where this magic number of eight is coming from.
because energy level two will hold a maximum of eight electrons and energy level three will also hold a maximum of eight electrons. So let's see how this works. So if, if we were going to now take the shell model and simplify it into this thing we call um, electron configuration, then we, we would freehand this notation the following way. We start by writing the 1s like this, and then that's followed by energy level 2, which has a 2s, whoops, which has a 2s and a 2p. Now I'm going to underline these to, in, to, to emphasize which energy level we're in. This is energy level 1. This is energy level 2. All right, and then for energy level 3, there's going to be the 3s and the 3p. And again, both of these suborbitals are appearing in energy level 3. Now, how do we utilize electron configuration to represent a particular element? And how do we utilize that configuration to tell which electrons are surface electrons and which, one, which ones are core electrons? So, Let's start with the simplest example. That would be hydrogen. The atomic number of hydrogen is 1. So when I go to write the electron configuration for this, I'm going to write 1s. And since there's only one electron, I put that in as an exponent next to the s. So the configuration for hydrogen, we would say, is 1s1. This also re represents the outer valence, because there are no other electrons in hydrogen. So this is the surface electron for hydrogen, or more specifically, the valence electron. Now, we move to the right across the period to helium. All right, And helium has uh, a total, uh, 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 an atomic number of two. And its configuration, again, its electrons are going to fit into energy level 1. And you can see the energy level 1 here has a maximum of two electrons. In this notation, I have one arrow that's pointed up and one arrow that's pointed down. And I'm going to leave the reason that I do that to other videos that have already been published on my website. Um, but for now, if we were going to write the configuration for this, since we have a total of two electrons. The configuration here is going to be 1s2. And the valence electron, or electrons for helium, therefore, the surface electrons, are these two electrons, since there are no other electrons present. Now, let's look at the next example, which is going to be lithium. All right, And things get more complicated here, because the atomic number of lithium is 3. So if we were going to write the electron configuration for this one, all right, this is what we would do. It's going to be 1s2, all right, and what we're using now is called the off-bow principle. So we fill electron configuration starting at the lowest energy shell, moving upwards only after we have filled the lower shell and have to move subsequent electrons now into the higher level. So how does this work? The first two electrons of lithium will go into energy level 1. Again, see the maximum is here. We can only get two electrons in here. Yet, we know from the atomic number that there are three. So the, the last electron for lithium has to go into the 2s, and we show it this way. Now, what's the surface electron? All right, Or another way of saying that is, what are the valence electrons? Well, here's your valence. These electrons here, let me use a different color, have become what we call the core electrons. They are on the inner shell. All right? They are on the inner shell because lithium basically represents, is represented by having one electron that is here, one electron that is here, and it's one shell, n equal one shell is full. So because we have one electron in the 2s, you can see that electron is a further distance away from the protons than the electrons in N1. So this electron here becomes our valence. 
Notice that the valence here, that single electron is in fact the group number that you find where you find lithium and for that matter is the same situation with hydrogen. So the group number in terms of the, of, uh, the two uh, groups of metals, the alkali earth metals and the alkaline earth metals, the group number tells you directly what the valence is. All right. Similar, that's similar for 3A through 8A, but when we look at the configuration, you're going to see that it's, it's a little bit more complicated to consider. Let's really quickly look at beryllium. All right, and beryllium has an atomic number of four. So when we write the configuration, it's going to be 1s2, 2s2. Again, the 1s shell, this is the core. All right, and the two electrons that are in the 2s are the our valence or our surface electrons. So in a chemical reaction, you see, that involves the exchange of electrons. It's going to be the surface electrons in all these cases that undergo the reactions. The core electrons are going to be left alone. All right, now let's go to boron. All right, and boron has got an atomic number of five. So how is this going to work? Well, again, we use the off-bow principle. So we write the 1s, and there are going to be two electrons in it. That leaves us three to go. The next energy level up, or the next subshell, will be the 2s. We're going to have two more electrons that can go into that. See, remember over here, the 2s shell has a maximum of two electrons that can go into it. You cannot put that third electron in there. But we have, in energy level 2, the 2p series. And in this, we're going to put that singular electron. All right, So it actually is appearing in a slightly higher energy uh, capacity because the 2p, you can see the way I drew the, the platform here, is a little bit further distance away from the protons by comparison to the 2s. So this electron right here is higher in energy. Now, let's talk about the outer valence. These electrons here in the, in the 1s are the core. They're, they're the inner electrons, inner electrons, unreactive and so on. The outer valence, all right, if we look at the um, group number for boron is 3A. The outer valence of boron, therefore, is the, both the 2S2 and the 2P1. Let me get a better coloration on that. It's the 2S2 and the 2p1 electron. So this is the valence shell for boron. All three electrons, one, two, three, equals group, group number. Now, let's look at carbon. Has an atomic number of six. So I write the configuration. It's going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p. Now, we've used up four electrons between the 1s and the 2s. That leaves us two to go. So they're going to go into the 2p shell. All right. Again, my inner core is here. These are going to be the electrons which are unreactive. The outer valence, however, is here. Okay, the 2s2 and the 2p2 for a total of four electrons. Again, look at your group number, 4a. All right, now let's go ahead and jump to neon. Okay, so neon has an electron, or it has an atomic number of 10. So following the, the system that we've used above here, its configuration is going to be 1s2. 2s2, 2p, okay, look at this. The 1s2 and the 2s2 electrons uh, total four. That means we've got six to go. All right, now, here's my core in the 1s, and that means that my valence is the 2s2, 2p6, put a box around it, 
what kind of a box. So this is my valence. And check it out, this is my magic number eight. All right, note that your group 8A elements, which are the noble gases, all have completely full energy levels or completely full uh, shells, right? Um, because the 2P here has got the maximum number of electrons in it. See, there's two, four, six of them that you can fit in there maximum, and then the 2S has got the two in it. All right, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and close the video. This should give you an idea of how to do electron configuration. What I would encourage the viewer to do is to go, go um, through and actually run the electron configurations for period three from sodium to argon using the same strategy that we use to do the elements from hydrogen through neon. All right, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and close the video. One last thing to say is that all chemical reactions that involve the transfer of electrons only involve the surface electrons, only involve the surface of electrons. This is important in the formation of ions, and it's, in, it's important in the formation of molecules.